Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm sorry there are only men on the, on the platform. Um, all white men, but all men. But this is a, a, a big issue which will affect all of us, men and women. And I have a huge admiration, I want to say, uh, for David Davis. I uh, canvassed for him in the by-election uh, that he called in 2008 uh, to save our liberties. Uh, and I think that um, he has said that first past the post is a Tory system. And I take this to mean, uh, without flattery, that he thinks it delivers MPs and governments that are like him, principled, honest, and decisive. But I'm afraid, as we saw in 2008, uh, David is the exception in these virtues. First past the post is a conservative system, ladies and gentlemen. Slouching, manipulative, untrustworthy, and dishonorable. Our politics isn't openly criminal, like in other countries, many other countries, but it is corrupted by over-centralization. There are called many causes to this over-centralization, but the, the valve that beats pumps dishonesty into the body politic, is electing MPs by first past the post and preparing for those elections beforehand. Just one example. It gave Labour in 2005, this was the government against which, uh, which put through 42 days, um, and it did so on the support of less than 25% of the electorate, less than a third of those who actually voted. Its method of focusing on the swing voter is a sophisticated form of cheating. And I have to tell you, there is nothing more conservative in British politics than the Labour backbencher. And I witnessed this uh, uh, for the first time with the launch of Charter 88, uh, which was independent of all parties, and we took it as a campaign to all the different party uh, conferences. And there was a Labour organization, quite successful, calling for electoral reform and a great rally, a mobilization against it to preserve first past the post uh, was organized, which I went to observe. And its keynote speaker was the, the epitome of the Labour backbencher, Dennis Skinner. We must save first past the post, he roared. I won't try to mimic his uh, rhetorical style. And he said it embodies the very aims and purpose, not only of the labor movement, but of politics itself. And he paused, and we waited for him to define this meaning. To the victor, the spoils. It is a system which openly celebrates the corruption of power in advance of obtaining it. And ladies and gentlemen, there's a connection between the way in which we allow ourselves to be governed by this first past the post, winner takes all, to the victor, the spoil system, and the great scandals of recent politics. The financial crash in which the taxpayers were forced to save the bankers, to the victors, the spoils indeed. And then the parliamentary expenses crisis, which revealed that our MPs uh, uh, were not protecting us, but rather looking after themselves, an atmosphere of permissiveness and entitlement linked to the city. And how did we respond to that in the 2010 election that followed? We hung Parliament, and that was a good call, ladies and gentlemen, but they were not humbled. They redefined the supremacy of the banks and the financial sector as the national interest, and the coalition was prepared with the open support of the civil service but to succeed in preserving the status quo indelibly linked to first past the post. They had to distract us into believing that they were also dealing with the crisis of legitimacy brought on by the expenses crisis. David Cameron said he would, quote, give the people power and control. Power will be yours, said Nick Clegg. It's a revolution. David Cameron told his party conference. To say this with a straight face, they needed to offer us a referendum. Is it the referendum that Cameron gave us a cast iron promise he would hold on the Lisbon Treaty? Is it a referendum on whether we English are entitled to have a parliament like those in Scotland or Wales? 
Is it a chance to decide whether the bankers should indeed get bonuses while they're on the welfare system we're paying for? No, no, no. It's not even a chance to choose a proportional system. We have the people power to endorse the status quo or embrace the smallest possible alternative to it. And here is the trick, the sleight of hand of all that parliamentary debate and argument that we're so familiar with. You said, you said, no, he said. If you vote no, ladies and gentlemen, because you don't trust the question, because you don't see the point of AV, because you regard it as even a contemptible compromise, then you will have been taken in. Your eyes will have been distracted. Because if the no vote wins, our political class will turn around to us and say, you see, we have the perfect political system. We offered you the chance, and you didn't even want to change it in the smallest possible way. And those who are voting no might scratch their heads and say, hold on a second. Um, I wasn't voting to endorse the way they're handling the bankers' crisis, the hyper-centralization of Westminster, to secure the rule from Brussels in this undemocratic fashion. I wasn't voting to preserve the status quo. <clears throat> but ladies and gentlemen, our political masters, Rupert Murdoch, the Sun and the Times, and the Sunday Times, the News of the World and the Mail will turn around and say, well, chaps, I mean, you don't want another referendum. You will have endorsed the existing political system. So we have to send them a warning, ladies and gentlemen. The premise of the status quo is, is that our rulers know what is best for us. And we must give them a strong hand, strong government, so that they can impose it. We must not rank them one, two, three. We must not open up the system in any way to possible newcomers. But they palpably don't know what is best for us. They supported the Iraq war, the whole political class. And we, the people, said it's not wise. They didn't see the crash coming. But if they'd gone down to the pub and met people who were paying their mortgages off free credit cards, uh, they would have met people who would have told them it couldn't last. Today, it may become even harder after the crisis to preserve our liberties and to secure our livelihoods. But if we endorse a system that celebrates giving the spoils to our rulers, we are asking to be robbed robbed of our freedom and our wealth, and we will be. So don't endorse the dishonest status quo by voting no and backing first past the post, winner takes all from us politics. Vote yes for a change. Well, Anthony, thank you for setting a good example by concluding your speech within eight minutes. And perhaps I should say that if the other speakers can do that as well, there'll be more time for questions. I was going to say something really about this point about coalitions. I do find what Rodney has just said rather patronizing, a sense of it's all raving monster loony party and references to children. Uh, if somebody under the AV system wants to say, I want to vote Green or I want to vote UKIP, and then that doesn't add up, uh, they can then say, OK, there is a choice between the two main parties, and I'm going to transfer my vote to that. And that's a perfectly adult and responsible thing to do. It opens the system up. And the thing about coalitions here... I think we've just had a very bad experience of coalitions, which has created, effectively, a government which is 
running the, uh, we ran a very interesting piece in, in Open Democracy comparing how co the, the culture of coalition governments across Europe with ours, which is pretending that it's just won an election outright, can tear up and do what it likes. It, to take one example, in Germany, the parties before an election say which party they will go into coalition with before the election. And the process of, of, of arriving at a process of a coalition outcome is openly negotiated. It isn't behind closed doors. So this is a kind of, if you like, our experience of coalitions is a consequence of this first-past-the-post winner-takes-all culture. It's not what a proper, honest coalition government would be about. So I think that this is, uh, there is quite a big shift here. And if I may make one just last point, because I think that Michael made this point quite rightly, if I may say this, that the offer we have been given of this referendum was, was cooked up, right? It was a manipulated elitist deal. It wasn't a principled uh, uh, referendum that we have been we have been offered, and it wasn't argued for in a principled way by the parties when they went into the election. But we have this referendum, and we've got to look at this. And if you say, no, we don't want this, oddly enough, the trick is, you will then be reinforcing the very elitist politics which produced this rotten question in the first place. Thank you. Could we have three more questions, please? Anthony Barnett will make the final speech for the yeses. Very, very uh, um, good and interesting discussion. Very good debate points on, on all sides. On some of the questions that have been uh, put of the six, I'm going to address three. I think it was the lady there who asked about why, what about an AV system on this actual uh, polling, this voting. There's a big difference between deciding a policy. I'm for people being more engaged in actual real outcomes with a deliberative process where they then vote on, on those outcomes. Uh, but that's obviously different from electing a representative on your behalf to, to create a national parliament. That's where the issue of, of proportionality or alternate voting comes in. So they're not, it's not the same uh, process. But it brings me to the second question about the nature of compromise. And the thing is, I think it's very simple. There are principled compromises and unprincipled compromises. There can be honest compromises and dishonest compromises. The problem we have with the Liberal Democrats, to take this one example, which is very current, about student fees, is everybody knew they weren't going to be part of the government. But when they ran for the election, they signed, every one of them individually signed a commitment to not raise student fees, basically saying, if we enter a coalition, on this we will not compromise. And then they did. So that was a, that was a, a dishonest compromise. But I'm, you know, there are honest compromises as well, ones that you, you can uh, signal in advance. We talked about the German system. The question of turnout, I think is very interesting here. Rodney has said at the beginning, the system is not broken. We've been told by our no, our no sayers that the system is basically fine as it operates. And yet they are all terrified that there will be an extremely low turnout. And they're saying this low turnout will make the whole outcome illegitimate. What if the, uh, uh, the, the no campaign wins on 15%? So this signals to me that you know that actually the system is broken, but there is a deep disconnect between the population, the people, and the voting, and, and, and our politicians. And if people, if 80% or 65% or, or of people just say, well, I'm not even bothering with this, that is evidence that the system itself is in quite profound political crisis, which is certainly uh, what I believe. And I think your view, this is my last point, is that this isn't really a referendum about, uh, in my view, the a V or not, is whether we should keep with the status quo is a referendum on first past the post. And those who, what, I, I emphasize this point, that there's a, a, another country, another monarchy, without really a written constitution, where they have quite, where they have, uh, 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 to the victor of the spoils, which is Saudi Arabia. And in Saudi Arabia, there is a campaign by women to get the vote. And of course, there is a no campaign and the no name of the no campaign is 
my guardian knows what's best for me. And this is the no argument, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm afraid they don't. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the debate, and 